All right, let's see. So we are recording. Yeah, we are recording now. OK, so um, yesterday we talked about the three three types of diversity. Today we're going to talk about the fourth. The first is species diversity, the kinds and varieties of animals. Then we talked about genetic diversity, how broad the gene pool is so that if something bad happens, you can recover. Then we talked about the ecosystem diversity, meaning that every organism has a habitat place to live that gives them the things they need. Those were the first three we talked about yesterday. Today we're going to talk about the fourth one is functional diversity and that has a lot to do with what we learned in last chapter. Looking here right here at this first bullet, the fourth component of biodiversity is functional diversity. It's the variety of processes like energy flow and matter cycling that occur within the ecosystems. That's what we learned last chapter. Take a look. This looks familiar, doesn't it? We learned about energy flow going from the sun through the plants and the consumers eventually to the decomposers and back again. OK, the flow of energy and then the matter cycling, the decomposers who put the carbon and the nitrogen and the, the phosphorus back into the ecosystem for the next generations to use. That's the matter cycling. OK, that's the stuff we learned in last, last chapter, and those are the main parts of functional diversity. So the main the component of diversity generally concerns the variety of ecological roles ecological roles that organisms play in their communities and they impact the roles that they have on the overall ecosystem. For example, look at this one, two, three. For example, the examples of functional diversity, where it, the organism fit, fits in its food chain or web. Is it a producer or an herbivore or a carnivore? What is, is it feeding strategy? Is it omnivore, carnivore, and um, is it primary, secondary, tertiary? That was primary, secondary, tertiary is the first one. Omnivore, carnivore, uh, herbivore is the second one and the third one here how does this behavior affect the chemical and physical conditions in the environment now that sounds kind of weird how does this animal's organism's behavior affect the chemical and physical conditions in the environment that brings us to the detritivores the detritivores are affecting the chemical conditions of the environment because they're taking the carbon from the first generation and getting it ready for the next OK, they're affecting the chemical com conditions of the environment. They're affecting the physical conditions of the environment when they're getting rid of all the dead bodies or other organisms like um, prairie dogs or beavers who are changing the physical conditions of their environment. Prairie dogs digging holes and tunnels everywhere and beavers cutting down trees and, and creating wet places. So they affect the physical conditions. So these are the func this is functional diversity. Now what we're trying to get into here is this this first bullet here. More than one species can share the same function. OK, like when two animals that are grazers share the same feeding strategy. Think about the savannas. You have giraffes and you have zebras and you have wildebeest. They are all grazers. OK, so if an ecosystem has a whole bunch of species that share the same functional traits, that ecosystem will be better able to withstand some species loss without losing functionality. The whole part of this is keeping the ecosystem functioning. Keeping the ecosystem functioning keeping it working, keeping it safe, helping it bounce back if something bad happens. If something happens to say one of the grazers on the savanna, say something, uh, some bad disease kills off a whole bunch of the zebras, you still have the wildebeest and the giraffes to handle the grazing. OK, so that's good functional diversity. If it has many species that share the traits, that ecosystem will be better able to withstand some species loss without losing the functionality. And the third bullet here, however, if an ecosystem has only a few with each functional trait, species loss will have a greater impact on the functionality of the ecosystem. The ecosystem will tank. It will break down if you don't have enough diversity. Look at my pictures here. <clears throat> so we have here on this bottom row here on this one, we have great diversity with the plants, but the herbivores, there's only this one kind and the predators is this wasp eats this caterpillar. That's all we've got. We don't have anything else and the caterpillar is going to eat this kind of grass. But there's nothing else to eat the trees and the, and the bushes. All right, looking at this next one, we just have grass and that's what the caterpillar is eating. OK, the rabbits and the deers, that's not their favorite thing. That's not what they always eat. All right. And the wasp, though, that's a big problem. The wasp will kill the caterpillars, but there's nothing to keep the the rabbits or the deer populations in check. Look at this third one. We've got the single kind of grass again, just this one herbivore, and we have all these different types of predators on top. These single caterpillars are not going to be enough to keep this many predators running. OK, so in any one of these examples, the, the population is off. OK, but if we took these gray ones up the middle. 
OK, we took these gray ones up the middle and put them together in a single ecosystem. That would be a nice, diverse ecosystem. You have a bunch of different producers, a bunch of different herbivores and a bunch of different predators. So the more biologically diverse the ecosystem is, the more stable it is and the more productive. OK, so that we that's the whole point is we want a good, strong ecosystem. So with a greater variety of producer species, the ecosystem will produce more plant biomass. A lot of times when we say in ecology, we say plants are king. So the more plant biomass you can have, you'll have more herbivores and therefore more predators. Okay. All right, so let's think this. Let me let me flip on our chat box right here. In our chat box, give me a thumbs up if you can if you think you can list for me the four types of diversity and tell me about each one. Thumbs up or down. If I ask you to list the four types of diversity, could you do it? And could you tell me a little bit about each one? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down in the chat line. I want to see who's paying attention. So give me some thumbs up or down in the chat line. I need to know who can can you could you tell me the four types of diversity and describe each one to me if I asked you. OK, give me some thumbs up. I right, keep those coming while I'm going on to the next thing. OK, I want to see who else give me thumbs. OK, keep those thumbs coming even while I go to the next thing. All right, the next thing is insurance hypothesis. All right, now, you know, when we talk about the insurance hypothesis, hey, Bubby, what you got? OK. OK, did you fix your social studies? OK, give me some. OK. All right, sorry about that, guys. All right, so the insurance hypothesis you know when you have medical insurance and you know when you have car insurance what they're for if you have medical insurance that's so that if you get stuck in the hospital you don't come out of it bankrupt all right and you have car insurance it's supposed to work that way anyhow you have car insurance so that if you get in a bad wreck or there's damages you don't come out of that bankrupt all right so when we're talking about the insurance hypothesis for ecology what we're talking about is that the bi biodiversity is going to help keep the ecosystems from getting tanked if something bad happens. You can't go bankrupt in an ecosystem, but they can stop working. All right. And they can stop providing the things that we need to have. So with the insurance hypothesis, let me flip back over to here. The ecological concept known as the insurance hypothesis states that the biodiversity ensures ecosystems against decline in their functioning because many species provide greater guarantees of functioning even if others fail. That's a big old bunch of mumbo jumbo. But what that's saying is that the better biodiversity you have, the more likely if something bad happens, the ecosystem will be fine. That's what it's for. The more biodiversity you have, the more likely that if something bad happens, whether it's drought, climate change, massive fires, whatever the case may be, if you have plenty of biodiversity, you are more likely to, the ecosystem is more likely to survive should something bad happen. So it's insurance. Biodiversity provides insurance. Okay. So the ecosystems that are biologically diverse, oop, mic's on. You good? <laughs> Who is it? You guys good with your mics here? All right. Let me flip it back over to here. All right. So the biodiversity provides insurance. So ecosystems that are more biologically diverse are more likely to include species that have traits enough to allow them to adapt to the environment, adapt to the environment, like disease or drought. So not just the number of species and the variety of species, but the genetics within those species. If something bad happens to the environment, you should be able, the animals should be able to adapt to changes. And such species would help the ecosystem maintain its resilience. Resilience, that's a word you're going to need. Resilience, that means ability to bounce back. Ability to bounce back, that's what resilience means. So such ecosystem, such species would help an ecosystem maintain its resilience, even if other species were lost. So this is what the insurance hypothesis does. The more biodiversity you have, the better chance if something bad happens, the ecosystem will survive or bounce back. That's the word for resilience. Now this uh, diagram here is one that's on your worksheet for today. Let's go through it and see what we can learn from just looking at the diagram. All right, is everybody ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me. Not on, just in the camera. Give me a thumb in the camera. You guys ready to go? All right, good, good, good. All righty. 
All right, awesome. OK, so now what we have here, this first block is a very diverse community. OK, down here we have a community with just blues and down here just greens. They could be anything you want to imagine. All right, now over here, this is the year two. OK, we have a warm year and apparently the greens love it and the blues not so much because the blue community almost died out. That's something we can't have. What we're looking here on the top, we know these are the good ones. If the box is full, the ecosystem is healthy. That's what we're looking for. If the box is full, the ecosystem is healthy. So in year two, this one here, we said the second year, the warm year, the greens are loving it, but the blue, their ecosystem almost tanked. But up here where we're diverse, yes, there's more green. Okay, yes, there's more green than there is blue, but the ecosystem as a whole is still fine. It's still a healthy ecosystem because the box is full. That's your biodiversity. It's still there. Okay, looking at the, the third year, this is a cold year and the greens hate it. The blues are doing great. Okay, but look at our diverse. Yes, there's more blue than there is green. Yes, the blues like it cold, but the ecosystem as a whole is fine. That's what the insurance hypothesis is. The better biodiversity you have, the more insurance you have in case something bad happens, you're going to be just fine. OK, so that's how your worksheet goes. All right, so now let's look at the next part. The next part of our notes is about natural capital and natural capital. Remember, we've learned about it a couple of times in the past. These are the things that the Earth gives to us. We are greedy things. We are greedy things. The Earth gives to us these things and we need her to give us these things. But here's the thing. It's not just us. Every single animal in their habitat is also greedy. They want the Earth to give them water. They want the Earth to give them food. They want the Earth to provide mates for them, provide clean water and good soil. They, every single animal wants this from the Earth. We're just smart enough to write it down. OK, so what we have here, these are the ecosystem services that the Earth does for us. And again, these are fours. OK. It's a group of four. Yes, take your hands up, baby. Do you have a question for me? No? Okay. All right. So you're going to have to tell me the four types of ecosystem services that the Earth gives to us. Okay, this, when she's given us our natural capital, she's giving us things, the natural capital. Okay, so in her provisioning services, provisioning, this word means to provide. Provisioning, provide. These are the things she gives us. She provides us with here in the red. OK, provisioning services. This is what she gives us. She gives us food production. She gives us water. She gives us wood and fiber for clothes and buildings, and she gives us fuel. So these are the things she provides for us. These are the Earth's provisioning services. OK, now under supporting services, supporting services here in the green, she does nutrient cycling. Remember with the decomposers. She does soil formation. She does primary production. This is the plants that in turn set up all the food chains. Primary production, these are the food, the plants doing photosynthesis, and they are maintaining all of the food chains. Then habitat provision. She gives us a place to live. Okay, again, this is the Earth's natural capital. This is what the Earth is giving us by giving us these ecosystem services. Provisioning services are the things she gives us, supporting services. Now down here on the purple, these are regulating services. OK, how does she keep the world safe for us? She has climate regulation, usually through the ocean currents, climate regulation, flood regulation and water purification. We learned about water purification at one when we, we saw those those clams in the muddy aquarium dish and how much we talked about trees pulling up the water and cleaning it for us. So these are regulating services that the Earth does for us. This last one, cultural services, some of it's kind of iffy. OK, spiritual and aesthetic aesthetic. That just means how beautiful the earth is and how it makes us feel better to walk in the earth, walk in the forest. But that's just neither here nor there. That's your personal kind of thing. But these other two you can't question. OK, educational and recreational. Those are definitely things the earth does for us. It doesn't have to be all hoity toity brain stuff. Now, I true 100 percent believe with the spiritual and aesthetic, but that's a personal opinion. OK, the other two you can't question educational and recreational. So these four things here, these are the ecosystem services that the Earth provides that give us natural capital, the things that she does. So now here's where we bring it back to the biodiversity. Biodiversity is vital to maintaining this natural capital. The Earth can't give us these things 
unless we have good biodiversity. The Earth can't give us these things unless we have good biodiversity. This helps keeps the humans alive and supports our economies. OK, humans, we have economies, right? We need these this natural capital in order to support our economies to keep them going. So with the aid of technology, humans can tap into the Earth's biodiversity to develop resources such as food and medicine, building materials and fuel. So the stuff that makes us humans, we have to have from the Earth. The only way to have it from the Earth is to maintain the biodiversity. We need stuff like materials like food and fuel and fiber. We need regulating regulating climate waste and pollination. All right, we need supporting processes like water purification and nutrient cycling. And then we need opportunities for the enjoyment of the beautiful outdoors. Biodiversity is going to make sure that the Earth can give us those things. Biodiversity also supports the natural ecosystem services like air and water purification, renewal of topsoil, decomposition of waste and pollination. These natural services would be extremely difficult to replicate if they cease to exist. Yes, we can filter water. Yes, we can renew our topsoil. Yes, we can decompose our wastes. However, the earth does it much better than we do. OK, we could do this stuff if we have to, but the Earth does it so much better than we do. And the Earth will only continue to do this for us if we maintain the biodiversity. OK, so the Earth's variety of genetic information, species and ecosystem also provide raw materials for the evolution of new species. Even before we started messing with stuff, ecosystems change all the time. Ecosystems change all the time, so that's even before we mess with stuff. So ensuring that there's enough genetic diversity, the species can adapt to the changes and we'll have evolution of new species if you give it enough time to run through. The third part of our chapter is um, evolution and speciation. So we're talking, I mean, extinction and speciation. So we'll talk about how um, these biodiversity allows for the continuation and change of life when the ecosystems change. Okay. Now this green graphic isn't as close to what we need, but it's got some good stuff in it. All right, so the functions of ecosystems and biodiversity, it's nutrient flow and water flow, productivity and pollination habitat. These are the ecosystem services that the earth provides for us. And the benefits that we get from that, food security, water security, health security, ecological security. And these are all give us positive impacts on human well-being, like the values of social, social values, ecological values, cultural values, economic values. All right, keeping our economies running. OK, these uh, last picture here is some that I had included in your notes. This green and yellow was very difficult to read, but if you look, it's exactly the same up here. The four types of ecosystem services that the Earth gives us to so that we can have our natural capital and down here in the tree, they're up here. These are the supporting services, regulating services, provisioning services. They're up here in the leaves of the tree the four types of ecosystem services that the earth gives us. So it's just however you want to um, view it in whichever way is easier for you to understand it. This is the clearest picture I could find of the four types of ecosystem services, the four types of ecosystem services and examples of each one so that we can keep getting the, bio, the natural capital from the earth. All right, let me slip here. Do you guys have any questions for me? All right, I asked you guys when we first came in to um, open up today's worksheet. Let me pull it up here. All right, this is that the this is the worksheet is biodiversity and the insurance hypothesis. This is the same graphic we just had in our notes. And um, in your questions, you're going to uh, give me the four types of diversity and define each one. You're going to state the insurance hypothesis as clearly as you can. OK, make sure it makes good sense. And then you're going to answer these three questions about the insurance hypothesis. Any questions before we get started? Alright, keep your cameras on. I'm going to shut off the video though. Let's see, stop recording.